On this month's episode of All Things Business, the podcast, we're joined by a very special guest. Northampton and England legend Steve Thompson comes in to talk to us about his story and what Northamptonshire means to him and what life is like now. Steve, Tomo, welcome to ATB, the podcast. How are you, mate? No, I'm just happy to be with a local legend of just like yourself. <laughs> so um, you've had a busy week. Um, we just before the bank holiday. The book came out yesterday. You've been here, there and everywhere this week. So thank you for taking the time to come and sit with me today. Um, for our viewers watching this, what does Northampton mean to you? It's massive for me. You know, it's, it's the place I was brought up. It's the place that sort of made me as such, really. You know, being brought up on the eastern side of town, going to Blackthorn Lower, Blackthorn Middle. Um, and then getting into Northampton School for Boys, which was a little bit different than it is now. They weren't very choosy when I got there. <laughs> Whereas now, um, I probably wouldn't have a chance of getting in there. Um, but, you know, it was, it was great, you know, started playing rugby at Northampton School for Boys. Um, but, you know, done a lot of sport, a lot of running around up at the Lings Woods and uh, on the old playing fields up there, walking down to Western Favel. And, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's sort of, as a town, I, you know, I love it. I always come back here. My mates are here and, you know, I just, it's sort of like a safety place for me. And I mean, we're going to come on to it a bit later, but it's, it's been well documented that there's a, a chunk of your life that you don't remember, but your childhood, if you like, or those sort of teen years, you've you, obviously uh, Northampton was at the center of that, but on the whole fond, happy memories. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Of course there were. And you know, it's, you know, we lived in the lads' house together um, down by the race course with Ali Heifer and Don Malone and Simon Heifer. Um, and I was in the Saints Academy then, coming through and, you know, lived live with Matty Stewart. Um, you know, had some great times, you know, down in Auntie Roofs and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's all these these great events that, you know, I can remember really clearly. You know, big chunks of my life in the middle of it is just not there. But the younger ones are there and they're, you know... and most of them are fond memories of, of Northampton. I'd, we watched obviously on ITV and on, on the BBC Breakfast interview yesterday. Um, the World Cup, you know, not, not remembering such a pivotal day, not just for you, but, you know, your family and your friends and those people that lived with you growing up. When, you, when you've obviously had to watch that back on a couple of occasions this week, has it, has it been hard? It's not hard, it's... It sounds bad. It's it's, it's been more hard because it's, if I'll be honest, it hasn't annoyed me, but it annoyed because people keep saying, oh, so you must have remembered that part in the mm. game and stuff like that. And it's like, no, but like I, can't, like I said, I can't even remember having a cup of coffee in Australia. I can't even remember being in Australia. Can't, can't, there's, there's just nothing there at all. It's, there's just a fat, ugly bloke on the TV that's playing in a number two shirt that looks quite similar like me. But, you know, and that's how I see it, that, you know, I was, it's there and it's like I'm watching England now, hmm. you know, but there's, you know, I, and I, I don't get any goosebumps. I don't even get like, you know, I see me lifting the World Cup and going to meet the Queen and things like that. And I, it sounds like I don't even get like proud moments of, and feelings because it's it's just like empty. And I feel a bit like sort of a phony when people start asking me about the experience because there's just no association with it. Well, that big fat bloke, ugly bloke who wore number two, he played a pivotal role in that World Cup final, as Sir Clive Woodward said, because before Johnny kicked us to victory, you had to uh, throw that ball in that line out 20 metres under an immense pressure. Because if you didn't get that right, we may not have won the World Cup that year. Um, and that's why, when, when I read that, I definitely got um, goose pimples listening to Sir Clive say that about you. Um, so bring us, obviously we've got the book that we're going to talk about. Um, but before we do talk about the book tell us about the, the 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 seven point plan and in particular i said to you before we started recording if the rfu are watching this what's the one thing that you would like them to take into next season if you like in terms of player welfare i think they they've got to start like a annual mot with the, with the brain at the top of that you know they need to get a baseline they, they're doing tests and things like that and memory tests and stuff but there's scans now that you can use and I think the players need to be scanned, um, so they've got a baseline. And if anyone does any have any head knocks, you can scan it straight away, see if the if the damage has got worse. Um, and I just think they've got to start taking it seriously. You know, they've they've got to 
get away from this six day HIA. You know, it's, it used to be three weeks, and all of a sudden they turned it ten years ago. Or so to to six days, and you think to yourself, why is it six days? And you think to yourself, it's just a coincidence. Those six days, you might get knocked out, and then suddenly you can play the next match. Mm. Um, you know, if you someone's got a tight calf, they don't play them. If someone's had a brain injury, they can get they can test them and get them back into the game. And it's you know signs of concussion can take you know a few weeks to to start showing. Um, and you know, like I said, a calf injury, a knee injury, an ankle injury, shoulder injury that's one thing. But when you injure your brain, you know I think that's quite serious. And you've got to start. Everyone's got to start looking at it and taking it more seriously. Let's put it that way. The moment that you found out about the brain injury. Just, just take us back to that, and in particular the moment when you were with Steph and, and you, your wife, who, um, who I suppose really it was it was closure on one part, but it was also like that explanation. But just, just take us back to that I'll be, moment. I'll be honest, like when I, when we got told because because of COVID, it took a while to get the testing. We, there was like three or four different stages of testing. There's like the physical testing, and what you're looking at. Then you got the scans and everything. So yeah, then we had to wait for them to put the report together. Um, and uh, that's right. You had the Zoom call. You did the call on Zoom, didn't yeah, you? Sorry, there. that's all right. Um, so then, then they gave us because of COVID, they gave us the uh, the call, the news over over um, Zoom. So you know, we had the scans in front of us. And before he said, and he said, "Look, Steve, why are you looking at these scans?" He said, "If you get, if there's a pinprick of signif of yellow, there's a significant brain injury." And when I looked at it, there's just great big slugs of yellow on it and that. And Steph turned around to him and was like, bit, and we were shocked by it. And then Steph went, oh, could he have got this, all this amount of damage from a one-off incident? Have you ever seen anyone's brain with that? And he, the dots went, yeah. So she sort of relaxed a bit and he went, no, no, he's dead. He said, if someone gets that much damage in a one-off incident, they're dead. You know, it was a head-on car collision. That's where you see that much damage. He said, what Steve's had is the repetitive knock so it's it's like someone sort of tapping your arm yeah. eighty thousand to a hundred thousand times your arm would still work that pit area of you will die but your arm will learn to work and your brain's very similar like my brain's learned to work around it and all the damage is in the memory and the emotional side and the mood sort of side of my brain so that eighty two hundred thousand is that that's the number of mini concussions that you've had sub concussions yeah sub concussions and they're saying obviously through training because in the old days, we used to do contact on Monday, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon. Um, Fridays used to, Thursday was a bit more relaxed, and then obviously the games on Saturday. So, you know, people's looking at the games, and it's it's good they're lowering the tackle and they're, they're doing that as well. But it's down to the training, you know. For me, I, they need to change. You know, it's quite funny. You know, when I announced and the Concussion Legacy Foundation, which is a big foundation over in America with the NFL and the biggest brain bank in the world, announced that it was coming to the UK at Oxford University. I was the number one person to pledge my brain to them. Um, and suddenly World Rugby on that day announced that they were advising that professional rugby, they should only do 15 minutes of contact a week. Obviously, they've advised, but they haven't turned around and said, this is what we should do. You know, and mm -hmm. They've sort of advised it, and then no one's really done anything about it. But it just goes to show, we were doing, what, 10 hours of it, and they've asked for 15 minutes. So it just goes to show what a massive difference there was. The Medigold Health Group is one of the UK's most trusted occupational health and wellbeing providers, helping businesses to keep their people in work safe and well for over two decades. Delivering services including absence management, employee screening and mental health and wellbeing programmes to more than 2,500 clients looking after 3 million individual employees. Twice winners of the Big Business of the Year Award at the Northamptonshire Business Excellence Awards, Medigold Health are redefining corporate healthcare through their commitment to clinical quality and technological innovation and supporting businesses of all sizes to succeed in achieving their workplace wellbeing goals. You've obviously, well, you've got a very good support network in terms of, you know, the Hefer family and obviously Steph and the kids, etc. and your close friends. Dr. Gavin's played a really important part um, in, in your life in recent times. Just just tell us about that relationship. Yeah, Dr. Gavin Newby, he's like my neuropsychiatrist. And um, 
I sound like one of these Americans, don't I? Like I've got my own sort of <laughs> doctor and all this sort of stuff and that. And, uh, He's my dietitian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've had one of them for years. <laughs> yeah, well, they, did, they got the sack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You've obviously used the same one. <laughs> but um, he has, you know, being all serious and that, he has saved my life because like, there's been times when I'm low and I've contemplating suicide massively and been very, very close to it. And, you know, I'm on medication now and I was definitely one of those people. Mental health is just for weak people that, that are just making an excuse. And medication is just for someone that's that's weak as well. And I was and I'm open about that. And that's what I thought when I was younger and and that and until you're in it yourself, you don't realise and you know, when you are close to suicide, it's weird because you just feel like you're the most selfless person. You just think that everyone would be so much better without you. And when you think about it, you know, it's, you just think you're doing everyone else a favor and you think, you know, but then suddenly they you know, come out of it and it's times we've got to realize what you're doing. And Dr. Gavin has been really brilliant because he's gave me ways of coping with it. Mm. Um, and ways of sort of, you know, the way he's explained it with my, the brain injury, what I was doing before is totally emptying myself out. And that's when, the emotional side and the memory side and if it just your brain's so tired it just stops working and my problem is i was in my late 30s early 40s thinking you know i should be able to do everything but because of the brain injury and when he looked at me he said steve you can either look at yourself as someone that's got dementia or you can look at yourself as someone with a brain injury how do you want to look at yourself and so i was like well a brain injury and he was like well that's the sort of answer i wanted to be honest because it's something i can go against it's something it sounds awful it's something i can blame but then also you think of an injury, you think, right, I can get, I can come back from that. Mm. And that's how I've coped in my mind about doing it. And like I said, he's, he's like, he says like your brain's like a Nokia battery, but the problem is it's an old one. And we all know what they're like. You plug them in, charge them for 10 hours and they last for an hour. Um, and that's exactly how my brain is now. And you know, before I knew that I was completely emptying myself out and I was just up and down. The mood swings were horrendous and not being funny. You've been, you've probably took, taken as much as Steph, if not more, bless you. And, you know, you've carried a lot of my problems on your shoulders and you've been there for me and you've seen that side of it, which is, you know, hard and I'm sorry for that, but I'll thank you as no, well. No, but, um, but you know, when you see it, it's, it, it's tiring mm. because you're constantly battling it and it's there. And that's what I found the hardest side. And, with young kids and then also, you know, the friends and family. I don't want to be that person that but when they, the, the phone rings and you look at the name, you think, oh, here we go. Like, I, I just can't cope with that. And I've been there and had people like that as You've well. You've watched me answer the phone to you. <laughs> or not, red button. <laughs> <laughs> but just on that, you see, when you had the diagnosis, I mean, I'd, I'd, I remembered when you told me and I'd, 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 I genuinely, I just didn't know. I was just shocked. Um, but one of the things I'm so proud of you is how you've thrown yourself into it to, to battle against it. So what I would like you to do is just, just talk us through and give examples of your typical day, just in terms of how you've adjusted your diet, your, your, your sleeping patterns and your, the red light treatment, the oxygen. Just just talk us through your average day. Well, the first thing I, I, I started trying to find out is like what's the quick, not quick fixes, but what's the best small one percenters, you know, that you can sort of achieve to try and make yourself better. Because my big saying is with the kids, when they're old, I want them to come and see me, not to have to come and see me. And that's the way I'm sort of looking at it. And obviously diet, everyone talks about diet and people always talk about diet. Oh, you diet, you lose weight and you, you're gonna be live and you live forever. And it's, it's not just about that, it's the type of food I'm eating. You know, and getting fitter, you know, I got one of the Peloton bikes. And at first I did go a little bit silly on it. I was, training three times a day you know I lost 25 kilos in just a few weeks and I, I really went mad on it but then that weren't really sustainable mm. so now you know one on it once a day fitness nutritional side you know eating lots of fish um you know still enjoy the curry now and then and Chinese and a couple of beers here and wine and stuff like that because it's all about balance of life you've got to be able to live as well but it is just raining it in a little bit you know the multivit side, a lot of fish oils um, down there. Steph, my must admit, she looks after all my tablets and at night it's like I'm rattling with, with it. But, you know, there's creatine, there's so many different, but what I am trying to do at the moment, um, 
and with the new role that I've got with Medigold, um, we're trying to come up with these sheets because, you know, it's hard to actually find anything about this for, with dementia for, or early onset dementia for young people. Hmm. I sort of tried to go out there, what can you do? And there's a massive list and you look at it and you think, where do you start? I need 42 hours in, yeah, in yeah. a day to be able to do all of that. Yeah. What's really tried and tested and looks really good. So at the moment I'm trying to be my own guinea pig really and, and trying to do that so I can help people because I know I'm lucky with the position I've been in and what I'm going through now and because of the publicity around it, people are offering me stuff to look at. Yeah. And, you know, I'm I, work-wise, I've had to give up a lot. And yeah. it's, you, you know what it's been like for me, you know, literally mouth, uh, month to month. And it's just been really, you know, I've had to walk away from jobs. I've had people turn me down for jobs and that because of the dementia and memory problems and also going on sites and stuff. I'm a liability when it comes to insurance and stuff. So, you know, looking at that, there's a lot of people out there that are going to be suffering. And so I've, I've looked at them. So what I'm trying to do now with Medigold is, is put a list together of the quick one percenters that people can do that are quite cheap as well, because it's, it's expensive. You know, when you look at the red light therapy I'm doing, you know, that's, that's, it's an expense that people think, Oh, and also is it one of these fads or is it? No, it's not. The, the red light therapy is amazing. The blue block of glasses, how I've, long do you do the therapy months, for? An hour a day. What, just and a solid 60 minutes or two yeah. lots of therapy? Well, you can do it either way, but I do it for an hour a day because then I'm on my fit, the thin air machine, which is like an oxygen, um, oh, what's it called? Altitude type training. So yeah. it's all about getting the inflammation and, and that away from the brain, but also it's helped the other injuries in my body as well because... You know, I've been able to train better and so I'll be able to get the weight off me, which which makes it and also it's the massive thing is sleep. You've got to get the deep sleep. You know, nighttime teas, pucker, nighttime teas, you know, little things like that. And <clears throat> that's that's made a massive difference. I've gone from having twenty minutes deep sleep yeah. to two hours on a regular basis. And you do wake up and I do feel recharged and I do feel like I can last that little bit longer in the day. Um and it's all these little things that I'm trying now that we're going to put together. You know, someone's contacted me on Twitter today and fr through rugby, he's had a lot of head injuries and he suffered seizures seizures for it. So he's going through a testing um, thing now with the NHS, but suddenly it's like, there's not actually much help that's out there. And, you know, away from that, look at the case. You know, there was three of us, then there was nine of us. Now there's 175 that have all been tested and everything like that, and there's hundreds waiting as well in, yeah. in, in, in the side of it. So, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there that are struggling, and it's not just rugby, it's yeah. football. It's not just that. You know, you think this time of the year, it's people gone skiing. They've gone over, they've, you know, hit their heads, carried on to the bar later on, they've come home after their skiing holiday, and suddenly a few weeks later, the memory just starts playing up a little bit. Change your behaviour. Change your behaviour, stuff like that. And, and they wouldn't have even associated it with that. But it's the awareness. And I'm not saying they're going to get dementia and it's going to be horrendous. But if you do start getting that, there are little ways that, that you can awareness. help it yeah, to, I, to help that injury. Because, I, I mean, you've said this before, but I think everybody's been affected by dementia, just like everyone has with cancer. But notoriously, everybody, rightly or wrongly, associates that with old people. And that isn't the case. And more and more young people uh, are having dementia or being di diagnosed with dementia and brain injuries um and i think there's a, there's a school isn't there in the in the uk that specializes in for, for, for children with dementia yeah, yeah through head injuries you know you think you know in the middle of birth or something like that and suddenly they're starved of oxygen and suddenly their brain and and never had a brain injury in in, in birth you know i mean they're a young young baby so, and so there's there's got to be our eyes have got to be open to this and the government you know, they promised to double the money going into it this year and they haven't, they've halved it. And obviously COVID and everything going on, but still it's a massive low blow for everyone that's associated with it, especially with it being such a key matter at the moment. And I know I'm in the middle of it, so you it's like anything, it's when you buy a red car. You suddenly say red cars everywhere, don't you? And things like that. But, you know, when you start talking to people, there's so many people affected by it. And it sounds, but it's with, with dementia, I always liken it to like the grenade going off, the bomb going off around it. If anything, when I start getting even worse, I'm all right. 
because I'm the one just sitting there. It's everyone else around me that's got to cope with that. And it's like, how do they work? How yeah. do they do stuff? And the support for the, them. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and understanding that what, what time do f family and that put people in homes? So can they afford to put them in homes? You know, there's, there's all this sort of scary stuff that's going on. And, you know, we, we've really got to look at it because, you know, even the homes don't recognise people under 60. So there was a chat that I met and his wife, she's only 51 and she's got to go, had to go into a home hmm. with dementia. And all the, the, the homes that are all part of a group were like, well, sorry, we don't take anyone under 60. So he's like, hang on a minute. So then suddenly he had to go to a, a privately run one. Yet yeah, they signed him off. That's a hundred grand a year. But then suddenly, imagine with all this, the, just the rugby crisis going on, there could be in the next five, 10, 15 years, 200 rugby lads, that big need, lads yeah. that need to go into a home that are in their 50s, late 40s, 50s. Is there going to be a place for them? You know, yeah. is there going to be anywhere they can go? And also, could your typical care assistant, I don't know, five foot four, five foot five, mid to late 30s, etc., it's probably going to take two or three of them to. Exactly. So if you've got a place in the home and so yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. a normal person or a rugby person, who are you going to take? Yeah, I never and you, it like you, can't, that you can't go against that. You know, you, you would do. You'd think you wouldn't want to put extra pressure on your workers by putting someone like me, six foot three and 120 kilos, that's at times in that period, I could be going through like anger issues and stuff like that. And suddenly so you think, well. I want, I want to talk about Many Gold Health. Um, they're the UK's leading occupational health business. Head office is in Northampton, born and born and bred business. Um, the align and, and again, something come. There's an alignment here between professional sport and business, and I, I'm, I've been a big advocate of that. I've interviewed a couple of ex-professional sports people in the past that, uh, about them being employable for businesses. But you've you've demonstrated here already about your professionalism, your de determination, that extra one percent here, and I want to find the one percent there, and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try that, test and measure, which are all things that every business leader wants from their workforce, um, which I think is probably why Alex, as CEO, welcomed you with open arms in terms of the role that you're doing for Medigold. So just just elaborate on that a little bit more and yeah, tell us. I think as well, it's it was great timing for both both sides. You know, with me as well, like I said, I've I've been very lucky that, you know, Medigold have taken me on and and also with what's going on, they're lucky that that I've gone on there as well. So, you know, it's a great partnership, I think, moving forward. And <clears throat> I'm excited by it because already now I can see the opportunities to help people. You know, a big part of their company is uh, mental health. And like I've already said, you know, I think a lot of people out there have got mental health issues, have probably got brain injuries that they don't even know about. You know, they've played amateur rugby, amateur football. They've had accidents, you know, falling off a motorbike and stuff like that. And suddenly they haven't really aligned it. Um, so, you know, that's one exciting part of the, of the business as well. And because they've got such a great reputation, it's able to spread the word quickly. Um, but then also I'm looking at <clears throat> how can we look at ex-sportsmen, ex-servicemen that are struggling to get them back on their feet, fit and healthy into a work environment. And that's why I really want to look at recruiting companies as well. Because I think because of COVID, it sort of opened it up to people like working from home a bit. And also that they've looked at people's lifestyles and you've got these ex-servicemen, these ex-sportsmen who are used to winning, used to doing well. And then all of a sudden, you know, for me, like you get a brain injury, suddenly your memory starts going. <clears throat> and suddenly you start losing respect for yourself because you, you're there. Confidence. And because you, you're so used to doing well and suddenly everyone's turning their back on you. Then mm. you look at yourself, you think, I can't do what I want to do and, and or what I used but to do. you don't know the do. reason why. You don't know the reason why. If we can get people a little bit fit and healthy or even understanding what's wrong with them, but then also, like I said, the Nokia battery, understanding the ways of working in a, a good working environment. What job, you know, it doesn't bother me if I have to go out and brush the street. Like, it killed me that I can't go on the big sites. Because you love, you loved construction. I, I loved going out there, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just switching it off as such and just, even if it was digging holes. You know, some that's not for some people. Some people want to be in the boardroom and that, and I've done that. And with my memory and stuff, it doesn't work as well now. So to go out there to have respect for myself. I was earning money, putting food on the table for the family, and 
I felt great. And then suddenly that got taken away from me a bit. So suddenly I've had to ch change and adjust. and adjust and do something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. I've been very lucky. I know that. So now I want to try and turn that luck for other people and look at recruiters because there's lots of jobs out there, opportunities. There's just so many great, fantastic people that are suffering at the moment. Let's just try and give them that little bit of help, the understanding of what's going on with them. And then you'll have a loyal person that will work for you and work with you for many years. And this, and this message, just as much as hopefully people will watch this and think, do you know what? That could be Dave or that could be Lisa. I think it's, it's the awareness for em employers and business owners to say, actually, I'm, I think I need to go and ask if, you know, Lucy's all right because she did have an accident last year or I need to go and speak to Steve to see if he's, um, so I think it's, it's twofold there. And I think what you're doing, mate, is great because you're, helping people that need it you're offering hope to those that are around them in terms of that you, the grenade that you're you, you gave a description of but then also it's just getting the wider wider population to talk about it as well openly um before we end the book is out um you can buy it from uh, amazon and, and waterstones um but you've done the audio book um just give us an insight to, to what that was like um yeah, when we said, I thought it'd be easy to be honest, audio, but you just sort of read along, and then I've had massive problems with my reading since since this, and it was another period to be honest. Like I'd gone a year and a bit really of realizing my memory was bad, having a diagnosis, having everything like that. And when it, when I went to do the first session of the audio book, um, I was obviously in this little soundproof room, and the the um, what's it called, the computery thing. They got it on, uh, like the um, you've called it off me now. The um, that I have to yeah, read it from, and so that I'm there trying to read, <clears throat> and I'm, I thought I was doing really well reading. And suddenly, this young lad who's and his name was Stephen as well. He he came in. He was like, "Steve, uh, what are you reading?" And I said, "I'm reading that. Like what you've got, in, I've got in front of me." He was like, "No, you're not. Let me just play back." And he started playing back what I was saying. And it was like another thing where I thought I was reading the word. And in my mind, I was reading the words. But from me reading it, it going obviously into my eyes, into my brain, from my brain to my mouth, the words were completely jumbled. And I thought I was talking properly and I must have been tired. And he's like, and I'm just, I listened to it. And I must admit, I just, I broke down. I was just, because it's like another, this has just been taken away, away from, from me. It, yeah. And I was just... And there was a lady from Bonnier Books there as well, because it's the first session, and they were in this room, and I literally just turned around, and I was just in bits. And um, I can just imagine this young 25-year-old lad thinking, oh, my God, what we got here? Like, if this lad starts going mental, <laughs> how am I going to cope with this? Or do we just lock him in the room and hope for the best? And and I must admit, fair play to this lad. He got me through that, and we went from, I think they thought I was going to have five sessions to doing I think 12, 15 sessions to get me through the whole book. Yeah. And we went for a stage after a couple of sessions saying like, I can't have the lines too close together. So on this big screen, there were four lines. So the words were far enough apart that I, I wouldn't get confused by the words. Yeah, yeah. And we're going through and, you know, he he was massively helped me and, and John Woodhouse, who was the ghostwriter, like I still have breakfast with him now and he's become a really good friend of the, you know, the whole way he put he helped me put the book together and and like I said it was it was emotional just listening to it and and doing it and then when he was playing bits back to me and then also um with that um I've lost that where I was wasn't that's right just you just on the audible book and John yeah and like <clears throat> with with that, so I went back to the kids and said, "When I read your bedtime story, do I read the story?" Of the thing? And they were like, "Sometimes." And I said, "What do you mean sometimes?" And I thought I was reading the book every time. They went, "I oh, know sometimes we just think you make it up, so we think it's funny, then we just and we just go to sleep sort of thing." And then with Steph, with like jokes off like Twitter or something, and she she said the same. She went, "Oh, I get, I just get the gist of it." Some like sometimes I read perfectly, and other times I don't. And she said, "Oh no, I just got the gist of it, so I just start laughing." Well, um, listen, mate, um, <sighs> thank you again. The book's on sale. Um, the Audible, I think, I mean, I remember getting the call from you after that first session and I thought, I didn't I didn't think you, you'd be able to do it or would want to do it. But again, you've shown that determination. You adapted, you overcame, you adjusted yourself to make sure that you got it done. And um, 
and you should be really proud of yourself for that. I know Steph and the kids are. So well done. Thank you. Um, people that are watching, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, if you haven't got a copy of his book, download the Audible. By the sounds of it, it might it might make parts of it are going to make you smile, um, and there might be parts of it where you might need a Kleenex tissue or two. But um, yeah, from everyone here, mate. Well done, Joe. Thank you. <laughs>